Hello, this is Joe with joesastrophoto.com, and today we're going to go over how to process a night's worth of data into a finished image. So before we get started with this tutorial video, I just wanted to mention that PixInsight has a 45 day free trial. So you can download their software for 45 days and you actually get email support and option to updates as well. So we just had a great night. We have lots of data and now it's time to turn that data into an image. So the first thing that I do is I go to processes and B-Link. B-Link allows us to quickly look over all the images to see if there's any that we need to discard. So we'll hit Control A to select all images and open. And this process takes a, a few minutes. So I just fast forwarded a little bit so that you didn't have to wait as long as I did for this to finish. There's quite a few sub-exposures, so it's taken a while. Okay, and here's our first sub-exposure. So what I do is I just scroll through these and make sure that there's no clouds. Oh, see, there's a cloud right there. So this one is 0029. So I'll go in and I'll delete that if I think that it's bad enough to affect the image. Also, while I'm scrolling through these to see if there's any bad images, I'm looking for the image that I want to use as my reference image for the rest of the process. You'll notice that some of these don't get stretched as well as others. You can click this stretch button and it'll automatically functions to all the pictures at once. This again takes a little while when you have this many sub exposures. Okay, we're almost done. And you could watch the image over here. And that's what it looked like stretched. So we'll continue to look through. Here's um, a, one, two, three pictures with satellites. Now in Deep Sky Stacker, um, I would have to throw these out. However, um, PixInsight Stacker can recognize these and it'll either discard the whole image or it will just discard the pixels that are actually affected here based on what image that I use as a reference. And actually one of these right here looked pretty good. I might use this one as my image. Uh, scrolling through and image 93 luminance Image 93 is probably what we'll use for our reference image. Looks pretty clean. So we'll keep scrolling through. There were some more satellites. Now we're in the reds, and you'll notice the difference in the sub exposures from the red filter. And we're going to hit the blue filter, and you could tell that this image is going to have a lot more blue. Now this is interesting right here, at 2.57 a.m. Um, it was on one side of the meridian, and at 3.07 a.m., so roughly 10 minutes later, it, had, it did an automatic meridian flip, flipped the telescope, and did a plate solve, and started imaging again. And as I said in my previous video, after the meridian flip, you will have uh, a mirror image. Now, luckily, PixInsight during the stacking 
we'll set them set everything to the same direction based on what you choose as, as your as your main image there's another satellite okay so we got through everything um, now we'll close this and start the process the, the batch process so we'll go in the script batch processing and weighted batch processing and here we'll add our lights just hit control a to select all the lights and this is cool um, pix and sight will recognize your different filters so you'll have blue and green luminance which there should be a lot more of and red and for flats I've been using a set of master flats for the last month because my telescope hasn't moved so I just continue to use the same flats now if you're in the field every night or you set up and tear down you'll need new flats every single day and I'll also use master dark from the dark library so you have to check mark these two boxes in order to use the master flats and darks so we'll add the flats so in here I've got flats and we'll select green I mean blue and you could hold down control for green luminance and red open those and you'll see them populate and then we'll grab the dark from my dark library I used uh, gain of 139 15 degrees Celsius or negative 15 and 90 second exposures and here's the master all right I'll go back to the lights and I believe I mentioned that we were going to use luminance number 93 for the reference frame so I'll click in here and then I'll find 93 in here and double click it and then finally it needs an output directory and what I do <clears throat> is I go back to the folder that I started with and I already have one here so I'll make a new one, but I'll make a new folder and I just name it PI for Picks Insight. And this one is PI2. And select that folder and then run. Now I've already run through this, but this process with this many sub exposures is going to take between 60 and 90 minutes. So I've already run through this, but normally we just hit run hit run and it's going to give you a warning that there's no bias frames and the reason that I don't use bias frames is because the camera that I'm using the ASI 1600 doesn't work well with bias frames what it likes to do is take flats and dark flats and it uses the dark flats as bias frames and because I'm using master flats I won't necessarily need the bias frames so we could just continue past this warning so after the weighted batch pre-processing scripts run you'll have a file that looks like this a folder and you'll have calibrated the logs and the registered and to be honest these are all the temp files and they're pretty large this one's 21 gigabytes um, this one's not large and this one's also 21 gigabytes after the registering is done so what I do and it may sound a little crazy but because it takes up so much room and I have a limited amount of drive space currently um, I've been deleting these If I have to, I could rerun the whole process to get them back. But really what we want are the masters. We're going to select them all and we're going to open them up. I know I only opened up four 
images and, and you're seeing multiples on the screen. This is because it opens up the integration, the rejection low and the rejection high. I normally, you could take a look at these, but usually I just close them. So rejection low, we need to keep this one. And rejection high, rejection low, keep, close, keep, and keep. So we should have four files. So the first thing I do is I see what they look like with the screen transfer function. And this button right here will just automatically auto stretch the image. Now by clicking this button, it's just showing you what the stretched image looks like and has not actually done anything. These images are still linear and they have not been stretched. So the next thing I'll do is I'll look and see how much I need to crop. Because not every filter and every imaging session was exactly the same, and we notice that the green is off by quite a bit. This is because we used the luminance as our target image. So you'll see that it doesn't need to be cropped, but everything else has, in order to match that up with the other ones and integrate them, they needed to be cropped a little. So we can open up the dynamic crop tool. And we just crop our image about like that. We could probably go a little higher, um, but I think that's fine. You know, we might, this might be distracting down here, so we might pull this up just a little bit so you don't see that bright star down there. Okay, so now in order to get all of these to be exactly the same, so that later when we stack them on top of each other or combine them, we're just going to apply these to each of the four. Grab the little triangle and just pull it down over and drag it onto the image. And then the last image back there, you can just execute it. Now all of our images are identical. Okay, so we're done with dynamic crop. We can close this. And the next thing I do is run a background extractor. I use the automatic background extractor. I was using the one that you can customize, um, but I've found that it's, unless there's something intricate, the automatic background extractor has gotten so good that there's no point. The other thing you want to make sure is this says subtraction under target image correction. And you can discard the background model. I think I'll leave it unchecked just so that you could see what we're discarding. So then I'll just run it on all the images. We'll start with this one here. Okay, so I've got that done. We could just take a look at the background and see what it extracted. And you, you could see that this is basically what the flats didn't get. Now, if we hadn't taken flats, this would be much different and most likely much worse. And this doesn't always get rid of all the background, as you'll see later on. So we can close this. We don't need it anymore. And we're going to minimize this, and just move it over here, save that in case we need it later. And so this is our new green image. We'll see what it looks like stretched. And then we'll right click, we'll change the identifier, and this is the green. So we're just gonna call it G for green, just to make it simple. And then we'll just do that three more times. We'll run the automatic background extractor. We'll close the background. We'll minimize. 
move it down here and see what that looks like and then we have luminance do the same close minimize all right and the last one and if you before we do that if you check mark this box discard background model then it'll automatically discard it for you so it's one less click or a few less if you turn this on earlier so the next thing we need to do because I forgot earlier is to right click and rename each of these because it'll make our workflow much easier this one's red I think I did the green one already and this one's blue or B okay now before we combine them I still want to run another process called linear fit and what this process does is that it makes the background of all the images match so with an LRGB we want to go to the luminance layer and you can just grab this and drag it in here or you can come over here and you'll see all of the windows that you have and we called this one L so L and I'll just leave the defaults as is and then I'm just going to drag this on everything except for our luminance layer Okay, basically what it did was make this background and this background the same. And it doesn't look that way because we had our screen transfer function on. So let's reset that and restretch. And there you go. That's, we could do that with each one. Just All right. So we can close this, we don't need it anymore. And we can go ahead and combine these. So real quick, I've got these customized icons over here that I saved and when you first start, you won't see these until you do it as well. And I'll make a video on how to do that. It's pretty simple, but some of these have settings that I like to save and not have to retype in. So it's easier if you have a project and have these already set. So here is the LRGB combination and we're going to uncheck luminance because luminance comes later in the process. But for now, since we renamed these, all we got to do is type in R G B. Um, you can, sometimes I get weird results when I, choose this um, but I usually try and experiment but not this time <laughs> so let's run this and it should make us a new image and we'll stretch it well, here's our combined image and it's not much to look at right now but we've got some, we've got some work to do so we could minimize this for now or close it we're done here the next thing we want to do is um, do an auto color or neutralize the background and the color calibration. So come over here. These are the most used and you can see that I've got uh, background neutralization used and color calibration. So use them both a lot. Now, when I first started, I was trying to follow instructions and people would actually put a reference image and they take a preview and of a dark spot of the sky to get for the background and everything 
But what I found is, is that doing that and just letting picks in sight pick for you, it's basically the same thing. So for the most part, and sometimes it doesn't work very well, but in this case, I think it did fine. And the same with the color calibration. Um, you could use a white reference image by taking a preview like this and just encompassing some of the things where there's white and then putting that preview in here and then using the dark from here. But in all honesty, I think that this will do it just fine by dragging it here and letting Picks in Sight pick for you. Okay, so there's our new image um, with the background neutralized and the color calibrated. And the next thing we're going to do is a multi-scale linear transform. I've got that here. And what this does, it cleans up a lot of the background noise. And at first this looks very complicated. And I've got the numbers populated. When you first open this, it's probably going to say 5.0 and um, 1.0 all the way down, or it might say zeros all the way down. And I honestly don't remember where I got these values. It was in a forum or a video I watched a long time ago. Um, but this works. It works really well. I've, I've used it several times over and it's, it's good. So um, what you can do is, is I think it's default is four layers. So you can add the fifth layer here and you could take my values and just incorporate them into yours as well. So the first thing that I like to do here is to take a linear mask. And in order to preview the mask, we need to um, turn the auto stretching off and we'll click preview mask and we'll look at the real time preview. So everything that you see in white is going to have an adjustment made to it, which is pretty much the background, but it's also going to be a lot of our nebulosity as well. So we might want to see if we could adjust it. See to save some of that. Just a little bit. That's an awful lot. Uh, you know, let's just let's just leave it at 200 and see. Um, Cause 200 is already uh, quite a bit, but every image will be different, and so you'll move this slider up and down, um, and the smoothness will affect, I'll just show you how it affects it. See, and I usually leave that about two most of the time. So all that looks good. We can go ahead and close this and we could take the preview mask off and it allow us to do that. And we could restretch the image so that we could see what we're looking at. Now what I normally do before I apply this, because sometimes on occasion, this is too much. Um, I'll take a preview of an area like that, just so that I could see, and I'll apply it to that first. So if we apply this, it's gonna take a second. Yeah, you can see it, it cleared up a lot of noise. There's still a little bit of noise, so maybe we could adjust these numbers slightly but I think that's gonna work for us because we haven't added the luminance layer yet. So that, that's good enough. We'll delete this and we'll just apply this to the whole image. Now, if we wanna look and see what it looked like before and after, we could just uh, undo that. And I could see a big difference in this area here when we redo it. Yeah, that clears it up real nice. All right, so we can go ahead and close this. We'll need it again later. It's time now to go ahead and stretch our image. I think I've applied everything I want to to the nonlinear. So we can reset that. And actually we could just close that and open our histogram transformation. 
and we're going to turn on the real-time preview and we're going to lock it and now you just want to grab this midpoint and you want to move it up to where it almost hits the side the closer you move it the more you're going to pull out and you don't have to pull everything out all at one time so that looks good right there and then you can reset it and we're gonna do that again just a little bit now if you notice on my screen here the colors are coming down in this curve and right here you're starting to clip some of those midpoints so we're starting to lose a little data so we need to be careful and on this side it's the same way when you get to the curb see your how much you're losing see the the image when I bring it way over here so I like to just set it right about on the other side of that curve but pretty close and then here I don't think we're losing too much data and I'd like to brighten that up just a little bit and then you could apply this And then we'll reset it. Now it's actually looking pretty good. I think that we'll just move this back just a hair. I don't want to lose those blues. Just brighten it up just a little bit more. I think that's going to do it. Okay. So we can close this and reset that for later but we'll close that and here's what our image looks like um, after it's stretched now it's time to work on our luminance layer and on the luminance layer it's pretty good at the moment I, what i want to do is uh, run a deconvolution and so you can get to that by processes and deconvolution, deconvolution. And basically, here, let me make a preview so you can see it a little bit better. Basically, this will add more detail. It's going to try and bring back the detail. Um, it's deconvolute it. So iterations 10 is usually pretty good. And we want to turn on deringing. And we want to move. Well, we could try it here, but usually I have to move this global dark down quite a bit. And I'll show you what I mean. We could we could try it on this sample here in this preview. And see what happens when you have the global dark too high. Um, so let's try and move that down to about, well, maybe half, and let's rerun it. Nope, still not enough. So we'll go down to 300. Try, try it again. Okay, this is almost there. I still see... Um, I still see rings and, and I could kind of make out rings around these stars right here. So I'm going to actually drop this down another 100th to 200th and, and run it one more time. Okay, that looks much better. Now I don't see the rings around the stars. The stars are a little smaller and there's a lot more detail here. Um, so now... Um, if you look into the nebulosity here, and I'll undo it, and then redo it, and you can see a lot of detail that came back. So let me delete this, and we'll apply this to the whole image. This could take some time, which is why I usually just use 10 iterations. Um, sometimes if you've got a very intricate uh, image, you might want to use more. 
it just depends on how much detail you think you could pull out without making the image look fake. All right, so we're done with that. We can close this. Now let's reopen the multi-scale linear transform again. And I guess I should have left the last preview, but we'll make another preview and just see if we could clear this up a little bit. Good practice would be to turn the preview mask back on and everything, but it, this image is very similar to the other one. I don't see a reason to go through the masking process again. Let's just see what it looks like. Okay, that looks pretty good. The, the idea here is to clear up some of the noise, but don't lose the detail that you just got from the deconvolution. So, but I like that, it, it looks nice. So um, we'll delete this preview and apply this to the whole image. Just about ready to add the luminance channel um, to our image. So this image is, was still, is still stretched, but linear. Um, I had closed this earlier and forgot about the luminance. So let's, Let's reset this. Well, that's interesting. Let's try it again. There we go. So we've, okay. So we can close this back up and we'll open up the histogram transformation. And we're gonna do the same thing that we did for our other image. Um, we'll lock it in. We'll turn on the real time preview and we'll just move this up out there. That looks good. We'll apply that. We'll reset it. And we'll do it again. We'll bring this back. And we'll bring this forward. And then we'll reset. And we'll do that one more time. Just to there. I'm starting to lose a lot of stuff and a lot of detail in my mids, so I think that's going to do it right there. All right, so I'll apply that. And I'll close this up. And then we'll open up our LRGB combination. And this time, we'll uncheck the red, the green, the blue. We'll add the L. I pretty much just leave the defaults the way they are, and we'll apply it to our image. This should bring a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. You can see the detail come in through here. So there's a few things that we still need to fix on this image. And we can close this. If you notice, because, and this is um, an artifact of the camera, but I'm I'm using the ASI 1600, and it has a, unfortunately, it has a micro lensing problem. And when you get really bright stars, you get this. It, everybody calls it micro lensing. It's not truly micro lensing, but. Whatever you want to call it, it doesn't do good for your pictures, um, uh, for your images. And, and all the bright stars have it. And it wouldn't be so bad with the diffraction spikes, but it puts almost a box, um, looks like, ar around the stars. So when you look back at it, it, it looks like there's a box around the star and a box around the star. And it's very difficult to, to fix. Um, especially in here. If this was just one star out in the middle of nowhere, like, like this star, you could kind of see it here, but not much. Um, I can go into Photoshop and, and kind of grab some black space and kind of clean up around that star, but I can't do that here. I mean, it, that would change the way the actual nebulosity looks, and then I, I wouldn't have a, a, a true-to-life photo. So... What we can do is we can 
and I also see I see a lot of purple stars which tells me that we've got a lot of green still in here but if we can get rid of the green I mean the the magenta color in here it won't look quite as bad at least you won't notice it um, as easily and so I'm gonna do what I do for um, my SHO um, images to get rid of the to get rid of the um, magenta stars and I'm going to invert this image and you could see all the green and you could you could still see some green in here and I think if we get rid of that it'll look a lot nicer um, so if we go to processes and um, the SCNR SCNR will actually remove a color and this color it's already set to green and 100% I'm just gonna see what this looks like and try it out could always undo it later if it didn't work okay yes yeah, I, I, I think that might have worked uh, let's reinvert the image yeah so now when we look in here at least the magenta is gone. I mean, so now it looks more like just a diffraction spikes on a bright object on your lens as opposed to um, that box. At least, I mean, you can kind of still make it out, but for the most part, I think, I think it's gone. I mean, it's there, but it's, it's harder to see, much harder to see. And all the little magenta stars are gone too, because those didn't look very natural. Okay, so let's close this. Um, we have a few more things to do. The next thing I wanna do is um, make a mask so I can mask this out. And we'll add a little vibrance. So uh, to make masks, I use the range mask tool. I and mean, there's a few other tools to make masks, but I like this one. Um, so we'll turn the real time preview on. Now this is just for the mask. And you move this slider, I mean, when it's at zero, it's almost all, all there. And in this particular mask, what's in white is what's going to be affected. And what's in black will not. So we can change the fuzziness, and you'll see how I, as I move the slider, uh, the effect it has. I think we want it about there. And then the smoothness. Yeah, that's not bad. All right, let's give this a try. So we'll hit apply to create the mask. We can close this, close this. Now to apply the mask, we just grab the mask here and, and move it onto our picture and We'll just minimize this and get it out of the way. We still might need that mask and it, it needs to stay there while this is being applied. Okay, so let's go into mask and turn off show mask. So the mask is still enabled, but we don't have to see it. And we can go to curves. Okay. So now when we do anything, when we apply these changes through the curves, it's really only going to apply to this area here because that's what we've masked out. So I can show you, let's go to saturation and let's just move our saturation up a little bit. Oh, let's turn on the real time preview so we can see what, it's gonna, what it looks like. Uh, this is the way it was. So I don't want it to look too crazy, but I do want to bring out just, just a little bit more of the colors, a little bit more of that blue. All right, that looks good. And go to RGB and let's pull this up just a little bit. I don't want to blow out the stars are already kind of blown out, but I don't want to blow them out too much, but I do want to get a little bit more brightness into the into the nebulosity. 
All right, let's apply these changes. And then we'll reset the curves and we're going to invert the mask. And now all the changes that'll happen will happen around this area to the background. And basically all I'm going to do to that is just pull it down a little bit and make the sky a little bit darker. Not too much, because all, all this that you see in throughout here and through here, this is still all dust clouds up there. But minimizing them, so I, mean, I don't want to completely get rid of them, of course, because they actually belong there, but minimizing them a little bit will make the platy star cluster pop out a little bit more. So yeah, that looks pretty good. Maybe just a tiny bit more there. All right, let's apply that. And we'll close the real time preview. And there we go. It's not too bad. I think that I'd like to make it a little bit more horizontal. But it's not bad. Um, let's remove the mask. We can close this. And I think I'm going to save this. Image 21 TIFF. And let's rename this to M45. And we're gonna make it a 16 bit. Uh, I'm gonna pull this into either Photoshop or Lightroom. So I want this to be at um, 16 bit because they both handle 32 bit fine, but every time that I take a 32 bit, from PixInsight over to there, it looks washed out. And when I take a 16-bit, it looks good. And once you're in Photoshop, you take your 32-bit and turn it into a 16-bit anyway so that you have more control over it. So saving it as a 16-bit to begin with seems to work just fine. I'm gonna minimize this and we're gonna open up Adobe Lightroom Classic. And we're going to import it in. In here, because in here I'm able to turn it a little bit. Um, let's go to library, import. Uh, let's see, it was the E drive M45. Here we go. And we'll import this in. All right, and I think what I want to try and do, click develop, is move, I'd like to rotate it. And I think if I turn the constraint crop on, it will, it'll keep it, it's basically gonna crop it, but I guess that's as far as I could go with it. Uh, what about vertical, nope. All right, all right, well, that's what I'm gonna have right there. And while we're in here, I think what I'll do is, turn. On. Well, first of all, I wanna turn the contrast. Let's try that, just, just a little bit, to get a little bit more separation in here on the fine lines. And we'll make the blues a little bluer. Oh, that's purple. Uh, Maybe just that much. And let's saturate them just a little bit more. Ooh, maybe too much. About right there. Okay. It's not bad. I, I think that's going to do it.